Hello, in this video I'm going to talk about motor units. Okay, so first a couple properties of skeletal muscle tissue. Uh, so skeletal muscle has four very important properties uh, that are very important for understanding force production and how skeletal muscle produces force. Uh, so first, uh, excitability. It's the ability of muscle fibers and neurons to respond to chemical, electrical, or mechanical stimuli. Uh, so this is unique to muscle fibers and neurons. Uh, so none of our other types of cells or tissues throughout the body are considered excitable. Uh, so it means that they can respond to chemical, electrical, or mechanical stimuli. So they can respond to a synapse, essentially. Uh, contractility is a muscle's ability to shorten to produce force when stimulated. Again, unique to muscle tissue, uh, that it's excitable, and when it is signaled to contract, it has the ability to contract. Extensibility is the ability of a tissue to stretch without being damaged. Okay, that doesn't mean it's elastic. It doesn't mean it can return back to its original shape necessarily. Uh, like silly putty, for example, is extensible. We can stretch it. Um, and that would, so it's extensible, but it's not elastic. When we let go, it's not going to recoil back to its original shape. Okay, so skeletal muscle is both extensible and has elasticity. So it's able to stretch without being damaged and it's able to return to its original shape after it's been stretched. All right, so motor units. A motor unit is a motor neuron and all of the fibers that it innervates. So the motor unit is collectively the neuron and all of its fibers. Every motor unit, or sorry, every motor neuron supplies a variable number, usually many muscle fibers, and every muscle fiber is supplied by only one motor neuron. Okay, so it's one motor neuron to X number of fibers. So there are many motor units in each whole muscle. So in every whole muscle, like biceps or quads or whatever, every whole muscle, there are many different motor units. The more motor units we have, the more control over force production we'll have um, because we can turn on our force more gradually. So think like, like if an entire muscle was one motor unit, then that would mean that when we activated that motor unit, all of the fibers in that entire muscle would activate and produce force. So we'd have very little control over that force because we wouldn't have sort of a sliding scale of force that we'd be able to produce. So when we have lots of motor units making up the muscle, that means that we could activate one motor unit or two or a hundred and in that way get more of a sliding scale of force production that we can generate from that whole muscle. Uh, so each motor unit may supply a variable number of muscle fibers. It could be five, it could be a thousand, depends on the motor unit. Uh, and the muscle fibers within a motor unit are distributed throughout the muscle to distribute the force produced by a single motor unit. Okay, so all of the fibers that are part of one unit, meaning that they're all supplied by the same neuron, those are scattered throughout the, the whole muscle. Um, so that means that if we activate one motor unit, we'll have sort of a distributed force, a very low level distributed force in that muscle, rather than it just being like one little part of the muscle contracting to produce that force. It'll be more evenly distributed over the muscle. All muscle fibers in each motor unit are the same type of fiber. So think about your type one, type 2A, type 2B. What we're saying is that within one motor unit, all of the fibers are the same type. There is no such thing as a motor unit that has blended types of fibers. Um, that's because the type of fibers that are in a motor unit, they are that type because of the neurological input they're getting from their neuron. So it's actually the neuron that causes those fibers to be that type rather than the other way around. I'm gonna draw a quick picture here to kind of illustrate that. Oops. Okay, so I wanna illustrate my point here. Move this out of the way. All right, 
So let's say we have this little motor neuron. There's my motor neuron. And we'll say that's a type one. And it's got some fibers. Okay, now we've got this motor neuron. It's a little bit bigger. And we'll say that's a type two a and now we've got a bigger neuron and it's a 2b and they all have their fibers okay so the properties of muscle fibers the different types of muscle fibers are in response to the activation that they're receiving so we know that type 1 fibers are very resistant to fatigue. They're, they're better at energy production um, so that they can act at a lower level with less force, but over a longer period of time. So those fibers develop those characteristics in response to those neurons, the type one kind of neuron, sending signals to those fibers that are demanding a low amount of force but over a lot of time. So the more signals a neuron sends to the fibers, the more those fibers must adapt to become more fatigue resistant and thus more like a type one fiber. And then the opposite is true. If we're not asking the fibers to contract very often, and when we do, we want them to produce a lot of force, those, the characteristics of those fibers will transform more into a type 2b type fiber and then like we've talked about before it's a sliding scale of fiber characteristics so whatever those fibers are asked to do by the neuron that's controlling them that's how those fibers will adapt to have those characteristics to be able to withstand whatever is being asked of them by their neuron so it's even to the point where experimentally I could take this type one fiber and switch it with the, or not the fiber, but the type one neuron, and I could switch it with the type two B neuron. And we would see all of the fibers transform in their characteristics into the other type of fibers. And then we could switch them back again and the fibers will transform back again. Okay, so every motor unit is made up of a motor neuron and all of the fibers that it controls, and all of those fibers will be the same type because they're receiving the same commands from the same motor neuron. Okay, also while I am here with this picture, I want you to notice that I drew the type one neuron as the smallest, the type 2A kind of medium, and the type 2B bigger. Um, so those neurons are of different sizes, and a smaller neuron is going to have a lower threshold and a larger neuron will have a higher threshold. And what I mean by that is that a lower neuron will activate and send its uh, signal to tell the fibers to contract. Um, so with a lower threshold, it means that it takes less of a stimulus to cause it to generate an action potential. A higher threshold means it will take more stimulus to cause it to generate an action potential. You could think of it as like a small bucket, a medium bucket, and a really big bucket. It's gonna take a lot less water to fill the first bucket. So like if I, if I pour a gallon into each bucket, it might fill the first very small bucket. It might only halfway fill the medium bucket and a third of the way fill the very large bucket. So when the bucket is full, that means it reached its threshold and generates an action potential. So that means the type one fibers, the type one neurons, are going to reach their uh, threshold earlier with only one gallon of water, whereas the other two types might not have reached their threshold with the same amount of stimulus. That's what determines the order in which the motor units are recruited. So the type one A, or sorry, the type one motor units will be recruited recruited earliest, they'll be recruited first because they have the lowest threshold. They have the smallest neuron 
So it has the smallest bucket and requires the least amount of stimulus for it to activate and tell all of its fibers to contract. Then as the stimulus increases, meaning the stimulus in this case would be the commands from the central nervous system to the neurons to say to contract. So when those neurons are telling the muscle to contract, the type one are going to receive those signals and activate earliest because it takes the least amount of a stimulus, a synapse from another neuron to cause it to activate. And then type 2A would be recruited next because now our two gallon bucket will fill and then type 2B would be last. So this serves a lot of different functions. Uh, this is really useful because it means that our smaller, weaker fibers are coming on first. So we have a more gradual increase in force because we're going from the smallest amount of force to gradually more and more force. So it means that we have better control over our force production and it comes on more gradually. Um, but it also means that the fibers that are best able to um, have more um, endurance and resist fatigue, that those are coming on first and will stay on for a longer period of time. And the ones that are gonna fatigue quickly, we're saving for last so that they don't have to produce as much force for as much time. Okay, so there's, a good reason for this, um, and it helps us with our uh, muscle force control and maintaining our endurance during contraction. Okay, so now we're gonna go back to our PowerPoint and continue on here. Okay, so the whole muscle is made up of a mixture of types of motor units. So in each whole muscle, there's no such thing as a completely type 1 muscle or a completely type 2B muscle. There is no such thing. Every whole muscle will be a blend of different motor units of different types of fibers. Um, now, some will be proportionately more of type 1 or more of type 2, uh, depending on whether it's a postural or a phasic muscle or depending on how we use those muscles. Um, so the proportion will be different but every muscle in the body will be some blend of the different types. A variable number of motor units may activate at a given time depending on the demands of the situation. So if we only want a little bit of force production, like postural maintenance or um, just muscle tone, then we'll only activate a small number of motor units. And then depending on the context and what's going on, as we want to increase in force production, we will gradually recruit more and more motor units. Um, and again, we recruit them in order of size from the smallest neurons to the biggest neurons. So from type one fibers to the type two B fibers. All right, the all or none principle says that if a motor neuron reaches threshold, so that's like where we fill the bucket, if a motor neuron reaches threshold, then an action potential is generated and all muscle fibers in the motor, motor unit are activated. So if the stimulus is sufficient that we fill the bucket with water, the neuron reaches threshold, then it will send an action potential that activates all of the muscle fibers in the unit. There's no such thing as like a partial action potential or only activating some of the fibers within the unit. There's no such thing, it's all or none. So either the motor neuron reaches threshold and activates all of its fibers, or it doesn't reach threshold and there is no action potential. If the motor neuron does not reach threshold, then none of the fibers are activated. The size of the motor unit is the number of fibers supplied by a motor neuron determines how much force may be generated by recruitment or activation of the motor, neuron, motor unit. Okay, so I wanna clarify something here. There's a difference between the size of the motor neuron and the size of the motor unit. So the size of the motor neuron is what I was just drawing for you. I was showing you that type one motor neurons are the smallest, so they reach threshold sooner. And then the type two A is intermediate and the type two B is the largest. So we're looking at the motor neurons and how large they are in terms of what their threshold is. The size of a motor unit, we're referring to how many muscle fibers are there in that unit. So we have one neuron 
and how many fibers are in that unit with that one neuron. That's the size of the motor unit. So a small motor unit would be like five muscle fibers and a large one would be like a thousand muscle fibers to that one motor neuron, regardless of which type they are. So the size of the motor unit has nothing to do with how big the neuron is or if it's type one, type 2A, type 2B. The size of the motor unit is simply how many fibers are there per that one neuron. So what we're saying here is that the size of the motor unit determines how much force can be generated when that unit is activated. So because either the whole unit is on or off, depending on how many fibers are in that unit, that is what determines how much force that particular unit is able to uh, produce when it's activated. Okay, so the motor unit size. Again, we're talking about how many fibers in that motor unit. It varies drastically from muscle to muscle. So in some places, we'll have teeny motor units with five or 10 fibers in them. And in other places, we'll have huge motor units with 1,000 or even 2,000 fibers in them. The difference is how much control we need to have in our force production in those relative muscles. Okay, so very small motor units, like five or 10 fibers, allow for a very subtle increase in force um, so as we recruit motor units, we'll have a very teeny increase in force with each motor unit that's activated if there are only five or 10 fibers in that motor unit. So we'd have that in uh, smaller muscles that require more fine control. So like in the fingers and the face muscles especially. So think about how fine of control you need to have of your teeny little face muscles that, that give us all different sort of facial expressions. We have very fine control over those and the ones in our fingers um, so that we can turn on very gradual amounts of force to very gradually increase and have super fine control over our movements. Now that kind of strategy wouldn't work in our huge muscles, like in our quads and hamstrings and big back muscles. We don't want to have to activate a thousand motor units because they're only coming, the fibers are only coming on five or 10 at a time. That's very inefficient when we have a large muscle where we just need it to produce a good amount of force without necessarily having um, super fine control, like for super fine motor movements. Um, so in that case, we would have much larger motor units where we could have a thousand fibers or even 2000 fibers in a motor unit um, because we just need it to produce force to keep us upright or to allow us to walk and move. So very large motor units allow for a rapid increase in force generation as more units are recruited. So that way we can produce a lot more force, a lot more quickly and efficiently um, because we have so many more fibers within that motor unit. Okay, twitch contraction. Uh, so although all fibers in a motor unit are activated when it's recruited, the fibers are not necessarily caused to contract maximally. Okay, so we have the all or none principle says that um, either the neuron reaches threshold or it doesn't. And if it does, it's going to send an action potential and activate all of the fibers in that motor unit. So that's always the case. That's always true. But what we're saying here is that just because the fibers all activated, doesn't mean that those fibers reached a maximal contraction. So if there's one signal to the muscles that cause one action potential in that muscle, then we have what's called a twitch contraction. And that's what we see all the way on the left in this little graph. Um, the red arrows, it says stimuli, that's the action potential. So and all the way on the left, we're seeing one action potential that that blue hill is the muscle contraction that happens in response to that action potential. So we're getting one, you know, it, one contraction of the muscle that then is fleeting. So it's not a maximal contraction, it's just a contraction response to one action potential. So the twitch contraction, a very brief, weak, fleeting contraction, like we see all the way on the left there, of the muscle fiber in response to one action potential. The latent period is a brief period of only a few milliseconds following the arrival of an action potential while the steps required to generate a contraction are initiated. 
Okay, so as you see in the picture, we see the action potential, that teeny little red arrow. And then there's just kind of a, a blip of space there before that blue hill starts to start. Okay, so that latent period, that's the little blip of space before we have that contraction in response. So if we think about what's happening in the muscle, we have to wait for, you know, so the action potential happens in the neuron, then we have the release of acetylcholine, which has to activate the receptors on the muscle fiber that causes the action potential in the muscle fiber. Um, so the sodium, ion, sodium ions are traveling and then that causes the release of the calcium that travels throughout and then the tropomyosin and the troponin. Um, so all of that is happening to cause the muscle contraction. And it just takes a, a few milliseconds for all of those things to happen once the action potential arrives. And that's the latent period. So the contraction occurs after the latent period. So now the calcium is flooding the cell. Um, so it happens after the latent period and reaches peak tension after about 50 milliseconds or so on average, depending on what type of muscle fiber. So remember, slow twitch take a little bit longer and fast twitch happen a little bit faster, hence their names. It may take another 50 milliseconds or so for the fiber to relax after the contraction because now we have to wait for all that calcium that flooded the cell to get taken back up into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, so that's what we're seeing all the way on the left there. You see that's about 50 milliseconds or so in the upward part of that contraction and another 50 milliseconds or so in the downward as we wait for all that calcium to get taken back up and the contraction to stop. Then this is just, that was all in the case that we had one action potential causing one contraction. So if there's a second action potential that comes before the relaxation period is finished, so before that contraction completely stops, then the tension generated by the two kind of add together. Okay, so if a second action potential arrives at the muscle fiber before the relaxation period has ended, then the tension generated by the second action potential is added to what is remaining of the first. We call that twitch summation. Another word is temporal summation or wave summation. All three of those terms mean exactly the same thing. So you use them interchangeably. Um, they all mean completely the same thing. That's the process of adding the result of one twitch contraction to another when the action potentials arrive close enough together. Okay, so in the second picture there, um, we see that we have three action potentials that are kind of spaced out but because they're happening close enough that the previous contraction didn't go away completely, they add together. And so that's wave summation or twitch summation or temporal summation where those twitch contractions are adding together. Tetanus is all the way on the, on the right there where we have all of those many little action potentials arriving. Uh, it's when action potentials are arriving sufficiently close together and maximum contraction of a muscle fiber is achieved. We're not saying maximum contraction of a muscle. We're saying maximum contraction of a muscle fiber. Okay, so individual fibers within a muscle can achieve fused tetanus while we're still at a, a minimal amount of force production relative to what the entire muscle can produce. A tetanic contraction is fused and smooth, which is very useful for a normal movement and task completion. Uh, the frequency of stimulation also is called the firing rate, and that's referring to how close together the action potentials are arriving at the muscle fiber. Uh, so that's an important determinant of force production because when the frequency of stimulation is high enough, meaning that they're coming close enough together, that's what's required to achieve fused tetanus, which is how we produce the greatest amount of force. So the rate, the firing rate, or how closely those action potentials are arriving, plays a big role in how much force that fiber is able to produce. Because the closer they come together, the more that fiber can achieve its maximal contraction and its maximal force. If they're spread out more, then we're losing some of that force and all of the space in between those action potentials arriving. Um, so we see the difference here between fused tetanus and unfused tetanus, like we see in number three. Um, like let's say you have a really good workout. Um, let's just use bicep 
like let's use a bicep curl just as an example. So let's say you've worked your muscles really hard and now they're exhausted. Um, so while you are working, you had fused contractions, you had very smooth uh, movements, but now that you've reached um, muscle fatigue, now when you're lifting, you might get that kind of shaking. I don't know if you could see in my video, I'm shaking, <laughs> it's kind of blurred out. Um, but like when you're really working hard in your workout and your muscles are shaking and, and it's not fused and smooth anymore, but now you're all shaky and um, having a hard time smoothing that contraction because the muscles are so exhausted. What happened there is that you ran out of resources to continue to respond to those action potentials at the rate that they're coming. And so what you get there is an unfused tetanus. So all of those shaky, all the shaky movements that you're experiencing is you're experiencing those hills that you see in number three in the picture there. You're experiencing those hills because even though the firing rate might be high, like in number four, your muscle's ability to respond to that high firing rate is depleted. Or also during muscle fatigue, what could be happening is that even though your nervous system is trying to increase the firing rate, it could be that the motor neuron is also depleted of acetylcholine, and so it's unable to send the action potential at the synapse um, to the muscle, so you might get what you see in number three. Okay, the size principle is what I described earlier when I drew my picture. Uh, motor neurons are recruited in order from smallest to largest. I wanna emphasize that's motor neurons, not motor units. So the size of the motor unit, that's how many fibers are in the motor unit. Nothing to do with this, Not, nothing to do with the order of recruitment. Order of recruitment is from smallest motor neuron to the largest motor neuron because the smallest motor neurons need the least amount of a stimulus to cause it to reach threshold. Smaller neurons have lower thresholds. So there's smaller buckets that need to be filled. So it requires less to fill the bucket and cause the action potential to be generated. Okay, so motor neurons are recruited in order from smallest to largest, and the smallest are the type one fibers, or the type one neurons that are connected to the type one fibers. And then they get increasingly larger until the other extreme, that would be the type two B motor neurons with their motor, or with their muscle fibers. So it's regardless of the size of the motor unit. So regardless of the number of fibers in each motor unit, the motor units with the smallest motor neurons, the type one, are recruited, followed by increasingly larger motor neurons until the largest motor neurons, the type 2b, are recruited. So that occurs because the smaller ones have a lower threshold, um, and that serves a couple purposes, like I mentioned earlier, that fatigue is minimized because the fibers that are recruited first are the most fatigue resistant, and then the least fatigue resistant are recruited last. It also allows for gradual proportional increase in force. Okay, so we're starting with the smaller, weaker fibers first and gradually increasing in the size and amount of force that the fibers are able to produce. All right, thank you for watching and I'll see you for the next one.